Season two of the Black Tech Green Money podcast is brought to you by Lexus, makers of the new Lexus IS, a luxury sports sedan that's all in on style, all in on performance, all in one package. Check out the new Lexus IS and experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. Afrotech World 2020. The founders of Brown Girl Jane are on the virtual stage speaking on what it takes to build both a successful marijuana company and a company in general in this current marketplace. Co-founder Ty Buchamp delivers some choice words of wisdom for entrepreneurs. I really think you cannot afford to prioritize profit over purpose. You must prioritize purpose first and be intentional about how you build business around purpose. Wow. And I promise you will lead to profit. Um, one of the other things that I, I we're learning, you know, when you have a lean team that we are funding, um, <laughs> a lean team that we are funding, um, happily, obviously. <laughs> I was like, hey. Um, <laughs> but, but with that, and we're grateful for people like Christina who, who really see our vision and join forces with us. That is the sisterhood. But every moment that we spend, if you go into it with the mindset that that's taking away from our business, opposed to helping us to build the ecosystem that we desire for this, for this community, our people, our tribe, and or for industry, wellness and wholeness in our case, um, we, would, we would probably be discouraged. But we're willing to innovate here. We're willing to invest. Um, and we're being strategic about it. Um, and so it's a wonderful learning uh, for sure, but I encourage anyone who is considering entrepreneurship, whether it be in tech, to figure out how you leverage your purpose in order to create the impact to drive profit. I'm Will Lucas, and this is Black Tech and Green Money. I'm gonna introduce you to some of the biggest names, some of the brightest minds, and brilliant ideas. If you're back in building or simply using tech to secure your bag, this podcast is for you. Dennis McKinley is the CEO of a business conglomerate which runs the Atlanta-based franchise, the original Hot Dog Factory, which boasts franchises nationally. A Detroit native, he's described as a serial entrepreneur and has background in real estate, e-commerce, retail, nightclub promotion, and franchising, which we'll talk about on today's show. Being from Ohio, I respect the Midwest hustle that Dennis exemplifies, that grind that you don't get in many other parts of the country. I asked Dennis about how growing up in Detroit played a role in shaping his entrepreneurial spirit. Man, that's such a tough question to answer, but I'm going to answer it with full transparency. You know, listen, man, if you grew up in Detroit um, in the 80s, in the 90s, man, it was just a, um, well, really the 80s, 70s, and 80s, man, it was such a, this is not just for Detroit, man, but this is like a lot of, you know, black cities, man, you know, growing up during the drug culture. Uh, we were all inspired by just like the drug dealers, right? Back in the day in Detroit, you had Young Boys Incorporated. You had some of those guys, man, that were, you just like see them driving in the neighborhoods, man. They got the same cars you see Isaiah Thomas and you're like, man, what's going on? And that just, you know, that kind of inspired, inspired every, you know, young kid to see like, man, I, I want a car like that too. So. Um, you know, once you find out how they were getting the cars, you had to make a decision. But, you know, no, nonetheless, man, it, it okay. definitely, if you had some hustle, man, you would inspire that for sure. So at what point was it that you found, okay, that's probably not the long-term life for me, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it, um, there's a real opportunity to make money on the up and up and really to make a legacy for myself and a name for myself in a positive way. Yeah, real young age, man. You know, I, I was really blessed, man, to have teachers and mentors that were like, hey, man, listen, like, you're a smart kid. Whatever you want to do in life, you can do it. Like, check this out. This is the right way to go. I was really blessed to have that, man, because a lot of people, you know, my circle and around didn't have those opportunities, man. So, you know, one of my first uh, mentors, man, was Don Barton. And I don't know if you know who Don Barton is, but, you know, Don Barton, you know, uh, he built the cable system in Detroit. He's one of the first black men, probably the first one to have a casino. You know, so I had some good mentors around too, man, that really kind of showed me, man, that you can get money, you know, you can be successful any way you want to get it, you know. I was I was reading your story and, and after you were an athlete, right? 
And um, after receiving some offers to, you know, pursue an education with sports, you decided to just dive right into business and entrepreneurship. And uh, you make yeah. you made moves in real estate, in the, in the film industry, the hair business and others and selling hair out of your trunk even. Um, and some people grow into their professional career um, super passionate about solving a problem that they had, you know, and starting a company around it or a project around it. And it turns into a business, at least on the outside looking in. Um, it looks like you have like a really good eye for just recognizing opportunity, even if it's not a problem that you personally have, but you recognize opportunity really well. Explain to me your lens and how you recognize opportunity and things that you're going to put your energy and resources behind. Yeah, man, I'm really impressed by you, by you, um, you know, digging me up like that, too. Listen, um, you know, I really it's kind of cliche, man, but I really try to keep my ear to the streets. Um, I really kind of try to see what's next and um, what can not easily be copied, right? And uh, just talking about the hair business, like, you know, when I got in the hair business, like, it wasn't easily copied. Like, you had to have a real connection, you know, to um, to China, to India, to really get in the hair business. Now you can go online and just buy hair on, online. Um, but, you know, I try to find opportunities that's very the barriers of entry are very high, um, but that's also popular. And, and that's really it, man. You know, um, I was kind of stuck to that script, you know, uh, throughout my career, man. I've been, you know, pretty successful doing that. So when you are, when you get confronted with opportunities, you talk, you just mentioned like the barrier, you, you're interested in things to where the barrier to entry is high. Talk to me about what that means to you. Okay, yeah, good example, right? Um, I just you know, bought a you know, major stake in the cognac company it's called, yeah, cognac. Now that brand has been around, you know, 20 years. It was, it was founded by uh, Remy Cointreau. They started that brand because the price, retail price of uh, Remy Martin, mean, Hennessy, et cetera, is super high, right? So they wanted to try to come out with a product um, that more people could buy. But once they rolled out that product, it was taking money out of Remy's pocket. So they said, okay, let's shelve that product. 20 years later, the guy who came out with that product, he said, man, listen, um, we were making a lot of money on that deal. Um, you know, we should really, you know, go right back after that, buy the name, buy the rice, buy the formula, go back to France where the recipes are still existing, right? Let's sell some, some cognac. Now, for the average guy, like, you probably don't have the resources or the connections to go to France, to go to the cognac fields to produce, bottle, manufacture your own cognac, right? That's a high barrier of entry, right? In fact, you know, it's so high, I would probably, uh, I would probably just say um, it's probably easier to make the NBA, really. That's how hard it is to, 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 to get that done from A to Z. Hmm. Um, but it was an opportunity, you know, for me. And, uh, you know, being that our culture, right, black culture, when it comes to drinking and consuming alcohol, like we drink cognac, like we are the number one consumers of cognac. So on one side, it's very easy to sell that product. On the other side, it's very hard, right, to, to, to get a meaningful stake to really make money in that industry. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good, you know, example right there. And I could spend a few more hours just talking about how hard the, the liquor business is from, you know, manufacturing is one thing, but you got to get, you know, uh, you know, state government approval. Like that's a, it's a very hard business. Yeah. yeah, I would imagine that, um, you know, with all the brands that are so well established that the, the story around the cognac and the brand identity has to penetrate to, you know, the African-American consumers or, or cognac drinkers of all races in order to make a meaningful dent. No. Well, Look, yes and no. When you talk about cognac, when you talk about who controls that business, like the French-owned families, you know, the bottles are, they all look the same. Nothing resonates to the culture. If you look at like what Hennessy is doing right now, like they're using Nas, and that's no just to Nas, but, you know, Nas is, you know, 40 years old, you know, over 40. Or you got a whole demographic, man, 21 to 40, who necessarily does not really understand the, the impact the impact that Nas had in our culture. So there's a huge opportunity, man, for millennials and under that uh, they don't want to drink their uncle's cognac. They don't want to drink their daddy's cognac. They want to be introduced and call something, you know, their own. So, uh, 
you know, no, look, the work begins now. You got to still introduce it to the culture, still have a good product. You still got to, you know, make it make sense. But, you know, uh, we can also say that we're one of the only black owned, you know, you know, cognac liquor brands, you know, in the business. Of course, Jay Z has, you know, a stake in Dupe, but other than that, it is non existent. So. Yeah, so I was really interested in, in talking to you about a franchising, and I, I'd like to spend a, a good deal of time here. So, um, you know, you, the original Hot Dog Factory, um, you have this brand, and I believe well, 15 or 16 locations now? We have the 13 now. We have, uh, you know, a few weeks it'll be 15. Okay. But, um, but yeah, 15 will be open in a few weeks, and we have another 30 or so in development right now. Across the country. And so did you set out to start a franchise, or did you set out to start one restaurant, and you like, you know, let's get this pop, and then you found a model that worked? And you wanted to replicate that? Like, tell me, walk me through the process of having one to having multiples. Yeah, I'll just rewind. You know, I was uh, 20 or so years old, and um, I had a few laundromats, and like, next to one of my laundromats was a subway. And uh, I was like, man, I want to like own a subway too. And I walked over there, I'm like, hey, man, like, you know, how much are you making over here? He was telling me, I was like, man, that's not too bad. You know, like, how can I own a subway? So I bought a subway like two or three months later. And I'm like, man, I'm making some good money, but subway, the franchisor is making all the money. I'm mm. like, man, if I get a good idea, like, you know, I may want to do this instead of running the subway because these guys will come in, you know, once a month, checking on me, making sure things are right. And and granted, man, you can make good money as a, as a, as a franchisee. But really, the real money I, I found out was in, you know, being a franchisor. So fast forward, like 15 years, um, you know, I was living in Atlanta now. Of course, I'm born and raised in Detroit. And, uh, you know, in Detroit, like, we, we eat corn dollars. Like, we eat hot dogs with chili, and onion, and mustard on them. Atlanta, you don't really have that option. So, you know, I was just fiending for a hot dog. I walked into this place. It's called the Hot Dog Factory. I'm like, hey, man. One wall was red, one one wall was yellow. I'm like, man, you need to like either rebrand this place or sell it to me, or, 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 or let me buy it from you. I'm like, man, you can buy it from me. I'm like, cool. Two or three months later, I bought it and uh, revamped the menu. And then people were coming in like, hey, man, like, why don't you have one on this side of town? Yeah. Hey, man, why don't you have one on that side of town? Like, man, start people start coming in like, hey, man, like, let me open my own. And I'm like, okay, I may have something here. Let me see if I can franchise it. That was like uh, 2015. So it took me two or three years to perfect the menu and get ready to franchise. And, you know, fast forward, now we 15, you know, open and, you know, 30 more coming. So there was, I think, at least three fast forwards there that I want to come back to because, you know, this is Black Tech Green Money. <laughs> I want to give people the actual step, like the game. So, all right. So the first fast forward I think I heard was, you know, you you got this laundromat and you walk next door to Subway and you like – put me on and two months later you got subway okay walk me through that so you know I'm, i imagine <laughs> you just don't walk through subway's doors and like yo i got you know five grand and they give you the keys to the kingdom so tell me how it happens to become a franchisee what's that step like yeah so you know basically you gotta you know make an inquiry and say hey you know this is who i am this is how much cash i have this is my business experience you know i want to join you know the subway family they call you back they interview you um you got to go to what's called a discovery day which is going to subway headquarters they'll show you you know what they do for uh, you know on a day-to-day -day basis and then they make a decision and say hey is this guy qualified to run a, a subway or not like that's how it goes if you get you qualify you gotta you know pay what's called a franchise fee to get into the business and then after you pay the franchise fee um, go through training and then uh, you got to go find a location or you can buy an existing location and then uh, you're in business. And that process is anywhere from, you know, depending on what's available, it could take 45 days, it could take a year, you know? Yeah. And so I, what, talk about like the economics of getting like what, at what level are most people that ultimately find success coming in? Like, are they coming in? you know, with a net worth of a hundred thousand or a million dollars plus, like, talk, or, or is there different levels for different types of franchises? Yeah, man. You know, another, man, you asked some great questions. That's why you don't, yeah, <laughs> good question. So look, there's really two sides of this game, right? It's, uh, it's mom and pop, right? 
and it's real um, corporate equity, right? Mm. It's, 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 it's no other way, right? Either you own one, two, three, four or five franchises or you have a hundred of them. Like it's really uh, no in between. And, um, you know, if I learned the game the correct way, I would have probably been on the other side, right? I would have came in and, you know, I would have probably had a hundred of them. But, um, you know, that's a that's a, that's another hour long conversation. But you know, being a franchisee, um, you know, when you talk about really committing yourself to you know, following uh, somebody else's rules, um, along with a safety net, it's the best way to go, right? Because you know, Subway already made the mistakes. I got yeah. factory already made the mistakes. All you gotta do is really come in and follow the rules, and you have a high probability that you're gonna make cash, right? Um, but the probability of you getting super rich, uh, not that great, right? Um, so, you know, it's a trade-off. What What makes somebody, you know, because what I believe I heard you say was like, there's, you know, this um, this this great divide between like the the rich franchisee and the poor franchisee the franchisee who has one or two locations you know I, and i use that like loosely but you know they make decent money for you know middle upper middle class um but there's the ones who have 30 40 50 100 locations and make the real money what is the difference between those people in your experience and that you've seen through your career of being a franchisee really it's um you know the, the big question is like how serious do i want to be right how, how, you know in franchising right because if you get if you get one and two you can do 20 and 30. that's for sure right um so the main question is how serious do i want to be how much effort do i want to put into being a part of the system or um you know you have multi-unit franchisees multi-brand franchisees that may own five wendy's you know five you know 20 subways you know you know uh, tim burger kings right um, there's a different ways to go about it, but it's really about how serious, you know, you want to be in the franchise business because you know, it's a serious game, right? So, and uh, it really is just mom and pop versus, you know, rich aunties and uncles, right? It's a, a great divide there. It really is. So, so if I if I hear you correctly, like it's like you're in one of your new locations right now, and so and I saw yeah. you pull off the apron, you know, when we first got on, yeah. right, which I which I I was like, oh, okay, he's really about it. And so I wonder when you say like there's some people who are really serious and there's some people who aren't. Is it um, that there's a difference between the people who work in the business versus people who just work on the business and and are remotely kind of you know distant from the operations, like they're really in there you know in the kitchen with the cooks making sure that their um loss is very minimal or making sure that operations are being followed to the t yeah listen um you know again um you know guys who own 100 units are not in there working right um however um look if you're a mom and pop and you want to work at your location one location Let's just say you make a hundred thousand a year. You may be happy with that, right? Uh, but if you want to make a million dollars a year, being a franchisee in any system, right? You got to own more than one location, right? And that's going to take a few things. It's going to take you to be a master operator. Um, secondly, it's going to take some capital, right? Uh, and thirdly, it's going to take a real organization, a real team to help you get to a hundred locations, right? Mm. Now, um, you got to decide. You got to decide if you want to do all those, right? To get to hundred. And then most franchisees may say, man, look, I'm really cool with one or two locations. I'm good with making 150. Like, I'm happy. I'm good, right? And um, other people may not have the ability, right, to, to build a team or go find the capital to scale to, you know, 50 or 100 locations, right? So, um, you know, but it all starts with the desire. Like, how, how hard do you want to go, right? Because, you know, from your desire, you can do anything. And so I, I kind of want to come even back – previous to your first fast forward it's like okay what were they looking for in dennis that says you know what well, we're going to even you know take him seriously like like i want to talk about like you know capital you brought to the table probably credit that you brought to the table um you know your resume that you said you brought it like what when you talk about levels of franchises and you said that there's some that are like upper echelon like the mcdonald's and the subways of the world versus the um, the nascent ones the up-and-coming ones or the ones that are just kind of mid-level 
that are um, uh, franchises you can get into. What are they looking for in the people? And what is that person bringing to the table? Yeah, that's a really good question. Every franchise system has its own kind of core values, right, of what they're looking for uh, in franchise partners. Uh, Subway is a little different. They're not the knock Subway band, but they were rolling. It was a Subway on every corner. <laughs> the likelihood of you buying a Subway and going out of business at that time, like at their peak, was relatively low, right? Now, if you try to get in the Chick-fil-A system in a brand new city that they're in, like in Michigan, like you better have an amazing resume, you better have some great capital and cash, you know, like you got to be serious to get into some of those things. So, look, every franchise has their own sort of core values that they look for, you know, when they bring in on team, team members. Like for the, hot, for the hot dog factory, you know, 100% of our franchisees are black or brown. Mm. Right? And we didn't, we didn't plan it like that, but uh, I, I, I noticed, right, you know, when I was going through franchise systems, like when I would look around and, you know, in classes and, like it wasn't a lot of us, right? It wasn't yeah, a lot of us. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, and we know where it is, right? It, you know, um, we have been economically disadvantaged for years. So I wanted to make sure when the hot dog factory, those barriers of entry were low. We talked about cash and credit. I wanted people who wanted opportunity for themselves, who wanted to, you know, provide for the next generation of their family, right? Who just understood that, you know, what ownership means, right? What black ownership means. So um, I lowered those barriers of entries, but a lot of the companies, man, you know, look, you know, if you don't have, um, you know, pedigree and 800 credit score and million dollars in the bank, man, you, they may not approve you as a franchisee. That's just how it is, you know? Season two of the Black Tech Green Money podcast is brought to you by Lexus and the new Lexus IS. With an available track tuned V6 engine and responsive handling, the new IS went all in to deliver you style and performance. See how when you experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. So many small business owners would like to franchise their operations, expanding their business through the sweat of other enterprising individuals. But maybe they don't know the steps. I asked Dennis, because presumably he gets asked about franchising all the time. When he gets that question, how do I franchise? What is he usually watching out for that causes him pause? Dennis McKinley speaks on it. Yeah, well, well first of all, before I get into the red flags, you know, people always ask, like, hey, if I buy this franchise or that franchise, how much money am I going to make? And listen, it is about the money. At the end of the day, you got to pay your bills. You got to pay employees. You got to pay rent. But I can tell you a lot of franchises that are out there where they're not doing the million dollars a year, but they're great ideas, they're great systems, right? Uh, people making money, right? You know, you got to make a hundred grand, but like the system works. A good example of that is um, like edible arrangements, right? Mm. A lot of those out there, they're not like franchises are not making a million bucks, but like people order those things, right? So look, I think you got to have a, a, a unique enough idea, first of all, um, and, 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 you, and you have and you have to prove it um, elsewhere that you call home. Right? That's very important. Ah, that's uh, good. Let's it, elaborate it, because, on that. Elaborate on that. Yeah, man. Because listen, you know, you may be popular in your own city, and people may know about you. But like, in order to really prove idea, you got to go somewhere that nobody knows you. Right? Nobody knows of this idea. You got to build it again. Right? And you can do that successfully. Then you got something. Like really simple and plain. Right. Um, you know, I'm, you know, popular enough in my hometown where I could take an idea that people would probably support uh, because they're assuming it's going to be great. Right. But, you know, I don't know anybody in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. I go there and it works. I may, you know, I probably got some. Right? So you mentioned a, a word a couple of times um, about a system. You know, when you plug into a system, the system of Subway or the system of the hot dog, uh, the original hot dog. When you in the franchise world, what does the system mean? Yeah, turn it off. Yeah, so the system is uh, you know the brand, uh, you know the, the brand identity, uh, the uh, yeah, thank you, the brand, the brand identity, uh, the operations, uh, the product, product consistency. Um, look, if you go to one McDonald's on, on the other side of town, um, you know north side, and you go downtown, they should all look the same. 
It should all feel the same. The product should taste the same. Man, that's the system, right? That's the system. And sometimes you get a franchisee who may say, oh, man, you know, what if I added this to it? Like, man, that's not the system. Yeah. Right? I know you really love putting sugar in your grits, but, like, we don't put sugar in our grits here, right? Um, and that's very important, man, when you're trying to build, not only build a franchise system, but when you, you know, join a franchise system, you got to understand, man, that, like, this is not your sauce. Like, mm. this is someone else's sauce who's created a, a sauce that they feel like is perfect or other people feel like it's perfect. All you have to do is just serve the sauce. Yeah. That's it. You know, that's the system, right? And, um, you know, to be a, a perfect franchise partner or a franchisor, you got to not only follow a system, but you got to, you know, make people follow a system. So, so that's very important. So then what type of person, um, to your last point that you just ended on, fits well in a franchise either from a franchise let's start with the franchisee which what type of person works well for a franchisee yeah so look um it, it's easy for me to say on the franchise or side man that i like people to come in here and just serve the sauce right but you know the end of the day like uh franchisees are entrepreneurs too right mm-hmm. they're taking this money that they made elsewhere they coming in hustling every day. Some of your best ideas are going to come from, you know, people within your franchise system. So you got to play both sides, right? Um, you got to listen. The franchisors also got to learn, right? But um, look, you know, I allow people to come in and, and, and just, you know, they love the system and they work the system, right? That's really, um, that's really it. You, I, I understand that you have a different type of operation at, at you know, the original, you know, because you say that you you want people who traditionally might not fit at like a subway or, yeah. or et cetera. Yeah. Where is the opportunity then? And because it, it sounds like you believe in this. Where is the opportunity then for us as black people who have traditionally not been in these spaces to find success yeah. with franchising? Because it got to be great. It's yeah. got to be great. No, listen. No, listen. Um, you know, I believe that the next generation of franchisors will come from the black and brown, you know, communities. Um, you know, there's a, a really cool, um, you know, business called Mama Empanadas. And I'm plugging these guys because I love the system. But, like, I don't know if you ever had an empanada or not, depending on where you are, you know, in the country. Like, if you're from Detroit, you know, what's our Detroit? You probably never had an empanada, right? But, man, they're so good. And they remind you of, like, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a hamburger that grandma used to cook, right, with a twist on it, right? I, I just, I'm just throwing that out there, but you know, there's a lot of uh, unique things within black and brown communities that, like, we just know as a culture um, that everybody will love. So I, I think that, you know, if you have a great idea, something that you truly unique to you, right, I, I, you know, that's the next generation of franchisors within America, because in 20, 30 years, like, the makeup of America is going to be different, right? Um going to be more black, more brown. And um, we need more things that we can relate to that look and feel, you know, like us. So, um, you know, so there's a a huge, huge opportunity for franchise uh, or, you know, within the black and brown community. We just got to get out there, you know, and and the easiest way to do it, I'll just piggyback on this, is to join a franchise system, right? And really learn, like, the ropes and how franchise Zores work, right? Learn how franchises work, right? Um, you don't have to spend a million dollars on that. You can go to like a, a small franchise like Jenny King, right? Jenny King is a cleaner franchise. You can get it to for like three or four thousand. If you join that franchise, you can see how the inner workings of a franchise, a real franchise system works, right? From setting systems to operations to, um, you know, you know, the sales side. Um, the co- compliance and legal side, like you'll learn so much. So when you, when it gets time to say, hey, maybe I have a great idea that I want to franchise, you don't have to go out and spend one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars with a consultant, right, to tell you how to franchise your business. You'll get a, you'll know, right, the inner workers of how franchise works to really make an educated decision on if you want to try to franchise this yourself. Um, you you mentioned um food service uh, industry you talked a little bit about um johnny king uh johnny clean i'm sorry and what types of industries when you look at the world the world of franchising and you also consider black people we typically think about food restaurants when we think about franchises 
what is ripe for franchising for the businesses that we're creating in large number? How can we change our thinking and think about in businesses outside of restaurants that may be good candidates for, for franchises? Yeah, let's just talk about the culture, right? Like for guys, where are we at on Saturday mornings? Barbershop. Like we had the barbershop, right? Yeah. Like, can, can you name me, you know, two or three, like, black franchise barbershop? I can't, name, can't name, name you one. I can't they, name you they, one. They, they, I can name you Borix and Supercuts and places that we don't go. There you go, right? Huge opportunity right there, right? And look, uh, our culture, we travel. Like, one day we may be in Atlanta. We may, we may be in New York. If you were in New York and you was like, man, I get my hair cut at this place. I know if I go to Miami, my hair gonna be cut right. You will go there when you go to Miami, right? Like for us, I gotta get my hair cut before I go out of town <laughs> right, to make to make sure I'm good, right? But if it was a franchise system that you knew were in Miami, like man, let me just make an appointment. I'm going to Miami. My hair cut gonna be right, right? Yeah, yeah. Like with within, within the culture, there's so many opportunities that we can create, right? The franchise, like clubs. I, you know, we talk about stuff that we do. Can you name a, a club franchise that you know that's in New York that's also yeah. in cannot. Miami cannot. or DC? We cannot, right? The opportunity is there for that as well, right? So look with, within our culture, man, there's so many opportunities that we can create, right? Franchise systems and be successful. We just gotta dig in and you know, figure things out, pull the resources together and get it done. So what would you say, having been doing this as long as you have, starting even with Subway? are the reasons we haven't seen the black supercuts or black bow ricks. Why have we not seen it yet? Yeah, I mean, look, franchising is relatively a, a new industry, right? It's, it's just now getting to a point where um, it's going to a whole, you know, new realm with SPACs and, you know, just private equity, like really tapping in and controlling franchises. It's relatively new. Like once you, like, understand that part and you understand that okay let's go to the other side like how many black executives are in franchise how many black people black and people actually know the franchise business right the answer is like pretty much none yeah like there, there are a few uh you know black and brown you know people who um, own a lot of franchises you know we got the hang errands of the world the mac wilburns of the world few people who you know own a lot of franchises but you know um they're not on the franchise or side right so you know, in order for us to you know have some great success we still need mentors to kind of show us and kind of learn from and glean from right we just don't have those opportunities so um like it's multi-folded and all you got to have a great idea you got to know how to actually execute the damn franchise right yeah. so you know those opportunities are just not existed and we you know we got to just tap in and Make Season two of the Black Tech Green Money podcast is brought to you by Lexus, who goes all in to craft a perfect package of style and performance with the new Lexus IS. A well-appointed cabin and available track tuned V6 help make the new IS the luxury sports sedan. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. What makes you and you, cause you said this a couple of times, like what makes your thing a great idea? Because I mean, I could say like, look, you make hot dogs. Like, what made the hot dogs the great idea, though? Was it because you took that type, that style of hot dog somewhere they they weren't serving them? Yeah, I'll tell the hot dog factory story really, really, really quick. All right, I'm from Detroit. Like we eat Coney Islands, chili, onion, mustard. Like you go to Detroit, you go to any corner, that's what they have. However, if you're in Detroit, like you can't order a Chicago dog. Will, where are you from? I'm from Toledo, Ohio. Right, right. My, my fault. You're from Toledo, so you know about the Detroit Coney. Yeah. Right, but if you in 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 Detroit, like, and you order a Chicago dog, they'll be like, like, what is a Chicago dog? But if you go to Chicago, right? Like they eat Chicago dogs. Yeah. And you ask them like, "Hey, like, can I get chili on my hot dog?" They be, they'll look at you like, "Like what?" So Atlanta is a huge melting pot. Chicago now is a huge melting pot. New York now is a huge melting pot. L.A. etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right. Um, and I said, "Man, I've been all across this country, right." And if you go to to Charlotte, like they eat coleslaw on their hot dog. 
If you go to LA, like they're a little more healthy. They like vegan options. They like lettuce, tomato. I'm like, man, I should just put all this together in the one room and like, let me see what happens. Because at the end of the day, everybody just likes the hot dog, right? Um, that was my experiment. It worked. People will come in like, damn, I never thought I could put baked beans on a hot dog. I'm like, man, but guess what? That's what they eat in Boston. I'm like, damn, for real? Let me try that. Boom. Now you got people, next time they come in, they might order a New Yorker, now they order in the Boston dog, right? So that's how that idea kind of transformed. And uh, it worked, right? Um, you know, but just having an uh, in Atlanta wasn't enough. I still had to take it somewhere else to make sure the idea stuck. So, uh, so you were introducing geography to different um, hot dog styles. Yeah, just, yeah, just by traveling, man. I graduated from the University of Michigan. After um, I had a real estate business sold it, I moved to Chicago. Boom, you know, now they eat Chicago dogs. I went to New York. Man, they put sour cream on their dogs. I'm like, what? I'm going to LA. They, they, you know, they deep fried it in bacon. I'm like, what? Right? So, just my journeys everywhere, I just picked up on like how people, you know, like, you know, eat different types of food, right? But my, my love are always hot dogs. So, that's how I, that always stuck with me when I had the opportunity to implement that idea. You know, boom, that's how it happened. And finally, I'd like to leave the interview here in, in having you talk about team building, because in order to do what you've done super well with regards to crew, with regards to Yak, with regards to club promoting, with regards to franchising, you've got to be you're the center in, in, in many ways of um, of all of those organisms. Right. And so I wonder, what do you say to people who want to do what you do, want to be in business, particularly franchising. Um, and what do you recommend they do to build their ability to both recruit and manage people? Yeah, I think um, at the end of the day, man, um, no matter what industry you're in, like your peers like have to respect your expertise. If you don't have the, the, the respect of your peers in regards to your expertise, it's going to be hard, very hard for you to effectively build a team, right? Uh, I know what I'm good at, right? Um, but I know I need a CFO, right? If the CFO don't believe that you're one of the best salesmen ever, like, if you in sales, like, I don't know if he wants to join your team, right? And that whole circle around you has to feel the same way. And I believe that 1,000%, man, it's going to be very hard for you like, to build an effective team. Now, that don't mean that you're not going to be able to build a team. How good the team is is going to be a question, right? Um, and in 2020, man, in the age of uh, artificial intelligence, of the, in the age of, um, you know, um, what does our educational system look like in the future? Like you need like real people with real expertise and real ability, or you're gonna be hard for you to build too. I believe that. Black Tech Green Money is a production of Blavity Afro Tech. Is produced by Morgan DeBon and me, Will Lucas, with additional production support by Love Beach and Raven Nearport. Special thank you to Micah Davis and Sakara Savanyan. You know, like the wine? Yes, that's his real name. Learn more about my guests and other tech disruptors and innovators at afrotech.com. Go get your money. Peace and love.